Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore and welcome to the Music Masterclass. So this is uh, where we're going to be talking about creating music, talking about the process of composing, arranging, impro improvising, and uh, just everything having to do with the creative act of making music. And as we will be doing now for the next uh, couple of months, three months here, we're going to be focusing on the uh, work that is being done as part of the Harmony and Chord Progressions course. And we've got tons of work that's been submitted that's been great. I'm not going to be able to get to everything today, but I'm going to kind of pick and choose some things. And um, as always in these sessions, I'm going to encourage, you know, if you have questions, things that I can clarify about uh, the the uh, course material or about the processes. And when you ask questions, I will also just recommend um, that you use the, uh, the, the thing, the little thing at the bottom where you can type in your comment in the chat that says add emoji and just add the little question mark emoji. You know, you might have to search for question to find it, but then you can put the question mark and put this is a question and that will just help me find the thing a little better um, you know so it doesn't get lost among whatever other comments there are and I'll try to get the questions and if I miss things just let me know all right so what I'm going to be doing here is we're going to be going through some of the work that's been submitted and I've uh, kind of picked out some things already that I want to look at and before I go further, though, I want to uh, first thank everyone for all the submissions so far. And also, thanks for the feedback on the process. You know, we're, this is now the, I don't know, maybe the third or fourth course of this type that I've tried to do, this sort of cohort-based thing where everyone's working on things together. And we're refining the process. And this is, by this is I think, the biggest one. Um, and so, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to make things as clear as possible. And so I really appreciate all the feedback on how to make these projects uh, easier to access. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then also ask you all to do uh, something that helps me out and I think helps you out. When you want to post your work, use this link here. If you're in the Harmony Workshop space, you'll see a link at the top that says how to share your music. And if you click that link, it will open up a page. Uh, I control clicked it to open it up in another window so I didn't lose it. But um, it will open up some instructions if you're using MuseScore on how to upload to MuseScore.com and then post your link within a uh, a post. So I'm going to definitely recommend that because it makes it makes it much easier than uh, first of all, it makes it easier for you to then up, update your uh, work if you want to make any changes to it later. But I think more importantly, it helps us, the rest of us who want to look at your work, be able to just see it directly online without having to download anything. If you've recorded a video, just post in, paste in a YouTube link and that works just as well. So um, I'm just going to be kind of flipping around here. And again, if you've got specific questions, specific questions about something that you've submitted, uh, by all means, go for it. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, uh, look at uh, stuff having to do with Project One, uh, which is the melody. And lots of submissions on Project One, but I also want to make sure that we talk about Project Two, which is the SATB arrangement. and try to talk about project three. We haven't really gotten many submissions for that yet. And so I definitely want that. So Margie, click that link and it will kind of explain uh, the process, but you'll need to pick either public or um, you can also possibly pick uh, unlisted, but unlisted is, is a little more complicated. So read the instructions and you'll see about how to do it if you want it unlisted. But I recommend public because it's not like anyone else is going to be hunting around and finding these scores and doing anything. You really don't, making it public just isn't an issue. Um, so uh, the question about if you submit work uh, later than this, like next week, will they get comments? So with 200 people currently registered in the course. Not everyone's, some people were just gold level members who already completed the course, but there's like a hundred people in here. And if everyone submits all the assignments, I'm not gonna uh, 
comment on everything. So it's going to kind of be me skipping around some, um, but that's why I'm encouraging everyone to comment on each other's work to make sure everyone gets some feedback. So that's the thing. So I'm gonna come back to Paul's here because even though he's doing project one, Paul has also given me chord voicings that will allow us to talk about project three a little bit. So I'm gonna hop around and just click some other ones here. And let's see, here's a project one. And um, this one here is from Kevin McDonald. And uh, and so this is what's nice. When you use MuseScore.com, we can just view it directly online. And that's really nice as opposed to if you attach a file, then everyone has to download it and, and load it into MuseScore. So I'm gonna be looking at some that are done this way. I'll be looking at a couple of videos and other things as well. So um, I'm just gonna play uh, Kevin's example here because uh, he's kind of created, um, a coherent melody, I would say, like everything's kind of all connected together as opposed to separate little melodies. And it's kind of, it's very cool. So we're just gonna listen here. I'm gonna start it over. So starting it over, here we go. Okay, so that is incredibly fun. So um, so this is above and beyond, right? I mean, I did not ask for anything this complex, um, but I wanted to recognize the amazing work that went into this and then talk about some of the things that make this work and then some of the things that are interesting to for us to carry forward. Because a lot of this is just being creative, but I wanna point out some of the things here. And I also want to uh, sort of, emphasize that the, the, the point of this process isn't to come up with like the world's most interesting creative melody. And Kevin is definitely pushing that, especially towards the end there. The point of this is to explore relationships between chords and melody. So right off the bat, and actually it looks like he's, this is the version here where he has, um, this is actually version two now that I'm realizing it, um, because this is the one where he's changed the chord progression around, but that's fine. Um, I wanna point out this, that idea starting on the seventh of that C minor chord and then letting the chord change to F and then resolving the melody, that's the suspension, right? This is what in the course, when we learn about non-chord tones, the B flat is a chord tone over the C minor seven, but then when the chord changes to F7, it becomes a non-chord tone that then resolves. That's a suspension. And he's actually used suspensions a couple places. Now he has this E flat that's a chord tone and then comes to the B flat and repeats that non-chord tone. I mean, the, right, so the E flat is a chord tone on the F7, but then the chord changes to B flat and he maintains the E flat in the melody, then resolves it. This idea of incorporating opportunities for suspensions is a very, I mean, I'll call it an advanced technique, but it's a technique you, you can use. And you absolutely, when you find opportunities to use this technique, it's really a, a beautiful sound. And I, I will highly encourage that. And he's using that kind of approach um, throughout. Now, one of the other things, I'm gonna focus on this simple melody here. This leap 
down is like that's okay. Big leaps down are fine, but there's other places. See, there's another suspension there. That A is a chord toner for the F7, and then he changes to B flat and holds on to the A, repeats it actually before resolving. So that's kind of another suspension. And then uh, again, holds the B flat while changing the chord to F and then resolves it in this case up. Right? Now there are places here. These um, ba -da -ba -ba -ba. This is getting very leapy, and this isn't necessarily a problem in a melody, but I do want to point out that leaps in melodies are, you know, they're spices, and so you want to kind of control how much spice you use in your melody. The other spices in the melody is when he gets to these, right, ba -da -ba -dum, syncopation, right? If you uh, aren't familiar with the idea of syncopation, it's the idea of a note uh, like a quarter note on an offbeat. That's the short definition of a syncopation or, or the most typical example. So he's got syncopations going on here, quarter notes on offbeats, and then again, again with this A here, quarter note on the offbeat. So he's using syncopation quite a bit to generate interest. Starting at letter C, he's got introducing chromaticism in there. And, you know, when I have the lesson on non-chord tones, chromatic non-chord tones are perfectly fair game as well. So, um, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's true that the chord symbols are hard to see. So hopefully if you've already done the work, you know what the um, things are, but I can try to make this a bit bigger. Um, but my, the minus sign is indeed a minor chord here. Um, it's Minor, the minus sign to mean minor is kind of, it's it's something that a lot of uh, like jazz musicians who handwrite chords uh, did, especially um, like uh, people of my generation and older. It's pretty well fallen out of favor at this point, and I'm not going to recommend people use minus signs because they are kind of hard to see. Um, uh, but minus sign does mean uh, minor, and some people will use a triangle to mean major just uh, as uh, an FYI there. So um, these chromaticisms, and then this chromatic passing tone here, right? These chromaticisms are nice too. You're, you're definitely encouraged to use chromatic passing tones when you're creating melody. So um, there you go. So yeah, and that's the other thing with minus. Minus is sometimes used, like sometimes people will write C7 minus 9, and that means C7 flat 9. And so that's another reason why the minus sign is a little potentially problematic. It can be um, kind of uh, um, ambiguous as far as that means. So in any case, um, Different publishers use different standards. MA and MI for major and minor is what most jazz publishers use right now. M for minor and MAJ for major, like for major sevens, because triads don't need an abbreviation, but major seven, MAJ, and M for minor is what most pop and rock publishers use. Most jazz publishers use MA and MI, and most um, uh, pop and rock publishers use MAJ and M. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I think Elliot, with any MuseScore questions, uh, if you posted them, uh, yeah, don't I, I post it to the discussion and support space. If you have MuseScore question, post them to the discussion and support space right underneath. Like, uh, if you look at the uh, Mastery MuseScore Four course, post to the discussion and, and support space. That'll be the place for MuseScore questions, and then I will get to them there. Um, Okay, so MI is for minor, MA major, MI minor. All right, so those are kind of some of the observations I wanted to make about uh, about Kevin's example here, but I also want to observe one final thing before I move on, and that he is starting to use some inversions here, right? He starts off just using roots in the bass, but at some point he starts using, right, putting in, this is the third of that C minor chord. Right? He's got a, a third in the bass. And so he's starting to create some interest in the bass line through the use of inversions. And then the B flat chord with a D in the bass. 
-hmm. right? So he's doing things like that to create interest in the accompaniment and then doing things like this little walking line here. Um, this little um, stepwise motion. F and then walking down to the seventh and then down to the third. We're gonna learn much more about inversions and how we're gonna use these most effectively starting in next week's uh, lessons. And uh, But it did come up as a question in, uh, someone else asked this, uh, Katarina, I think, had asked about you know, wh whether we should be using inversions. And realistically for this kind of um, simple type of accompaniment that we're creating here, no, we typically just use root position mostly. So there you go. Um, all right, I'm gonna flip around some more. Let me, um, I'll just close this one because, well, I'm, I'm afraid to close it because we will, uh, someone then will have a question on it and uh, um, this one I don't need. Um, and I want to get it back. So next I want to flip over to one that was done as a video. And this is from Larry Hankins. And Larry's version, he just did, he did these as videos. And this is totally fine, right? All right, so beautiful. So Nick is asking about DJ7. Yeah, I've never seen that before, but you know, different regions of the world and different subgenres of music can have their own conventions. And I can totally believe that there exists some context in which some group of musicians may understand J to mean major. Um, but I've never seen it. And I'm only guessing that it would mean major. Um, so yeah, that could be one of those things like in German editions, like using H for B, uh, right? That's a, a German thing also. And yeah, maybe that's uh, just something that is done. I'm not familiar with it. So this idea that you can post a video and Larry described this as uh, um, he just rubber band his phone to a, a post. Uh, like, um, yeah, he, he rubber banded his, um, his iPhone to a mic stand or something and just held it over the, and, and that worked. I've done all sorts of jury rigged things like that. In fact, let me show you my, my other camera setup. Gooseneck lamp, gooseneck lamp sitting on the piano. And then I have a hair tie here. And the hair tie here I use to attach uh, my camera. So this is my portable setup when I want to do a video like somewhere else uh, where I don't have all my complicated stuff. I just bring that little lamp and that hair tie and then I can attach my phone or a little portable webcam. So um, there you go. And yes, there's all sorts of devices you could buy. You can get mic stands that have uh, phone holders. So that's possibility too. So let's just uh, listen once again, though, to the to the music itself. And I just want to point out a couple things about this. Right off, he started with a non chord tone. Starting off with a non chord tone is totally fine, right? It's um, it's going to give this a richer sound. And obviously, you can kind of tell Larry's coming from a jazz perspective, and he posted several others that are just like square, like just absolutely jazz. But this was one that was kind of gener generic enough that um, by generic, I mean, it's not trying to be too jazzy. I think he's like trying to say, hey, let's let's simplify things. And so that's why I wanna focus on this one rather than all the more complex jazz things that he also did. So, so already, just by Bump by starting right off on a non chord tone. That's not necessarily only jazz, but it's definitely a jazzy thing to use more non chord tones in your melody. And it's a constant one, right? It's a whole step above a chord tone. A whole step above a chord tone. C is a whole step above B flat. And then this F is a whole step above that E flat chord. In a jazz setting, this isn't going to raise any eyebrows at all. That's going to totally make sense. Right? This is going to be totally within bounds for jazz. 
If you're not trying to sound like jazz, then you probably don't want to use that many non-chord tones. That C here and that F there. That's probably going to be pushing you in a jazz direction. So, but on the other hand, he's also going in a jazz direction through the syncopation, right? Bum, one, two, and. By having that note on the and, and then uh, changing the chord and sustaining that note, that note on the and being sustained is again a form of syncopation. So between his non-chord tones and his uh, syncopation, he's saying jazz. But on the other hand, you could use those non-chord tones without saying jazz. Right now, I've just connected them smoother, and I'm still using the non-chord tones, and still land, still starting on the C, still landing on the F, and but now I've removed the syncopation, and so there might be a world in which that's the sound you want, where you you want the harmonic richness, the color that comes from the non-chord tones, but you don't want it to just scream jazz at you. And yeah, again, Larry's other ones scream jazz much more loudly than this one. Um, so uh, this idea that you might want to incorporate more color and be, be okay with that degree of color non-chord tones being used prominently like this, this is going to be an important thing as we start really digging deeper into harmony, because you're going to want to put chords underneath a melody that that melody note is not going to be a chord tone in, right? You're going to say, hey, I want to harmonize this F, and I really want to put that four chord there because I have just learned about harmony and how four chords work, and I think that four chord is going to be great for the chord progression. And then your question is, is it going to sound okay with an F above it? This is why we explore these things. So you can find out, well, what does it sound like to have F being sustained over an E flat major chord? Whether you play it as a triad or a major seventh chord, it's just gonna have a bit of a jazzy feel and that can be fine. The other thing I wanna point out here, right there, right? He does that thing, which is exactly, let me uh, back up just a little bit. A little more. So again, syncopation. But these double stops here, double stops is what it means when you play two notes at a time. It uh, comes from you know stringed instruments, violin, where you're literally bowing two strings at a time. Um, uh, but this, does that seem at all familiar to you? Well, I'll tell you why it should. Because in Abide With Me, had that. We had that exact same thing of a B flat chord with these notes as passing tones. Larry is doing that exact same thing in the other direction. When he does it with, with the syncopation and the articulation, it sounds like jazz. But Abide With Me was not jazz. Abide With Me was just a hymn that used passing tones. So there's nothing about that particular technique that's specifically jazz, but it's definitely something that jazz musicians have glommed onto as a thing. And yeah, those types of lines are very Gene Harris-like. That's a very good, uh, Gene Harris is a, a jazz pianist who really goes for those kinds of bluesy sounds. That sort of, especially if we put little grace notes, grace notes and things like that in it, it becomes that much bluesier. All right, so that's Larry's example. Um, I'm going to flip around here, and we're just going to check out some others. Um, so this uh, was Brian um, modifying his melody here to try to fit different chords. And so I want to talk about this a little bit, um, uh, because this was part B of the assignment. So here was his original melody, and I'm actually going to start with the, uh, I'm going to skip the half note one, and I'm going to start with uh, just the one, um, you know, where he starts doing, you know, real, real rhythms.
So there's that four bar line. And Michael's using a uh, gospel country. Yeah, well, these are all things that come from blues. Blues and gospel music, um, it, it, it's just put not to maybe oversimplify a little bit, both what we think of now as blues music and what we think of as gospel music have their roots in the late 19th century. And they kind of came together to form jazz and then came to then therefore inform modern gospel music as well as country music, as well as lots of other, you know, modern pop types of genres. But if we want to talk about where they're coming from, I would say blues guitar, blues guitarists in the 19th century. Not that we have recordings of them, but we have early 20th century recordings of blues guitarists, courtesy of Alan Lomax. And you can definitely hear those sorts of things happening on guitar. And yeah, those grace note things is a Floyd Kramer thing in the country world and Vince Guaraldi in the jazz world are famous for that kind of sounds. These double stops with grace notes into them. Floyd Kramer on the countryside, Vince Guaraldi on the jazz side are like, that's a huge part of their styles. Okay, so this melody here, it's, it's really focused on chord tones, right? It's a chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone, chord tone. Chord tone, right? So every time the chord changes, there's a chord tone. That's, you know, that's the expected thing. We've seen from some of those other ones that you don't have to be that expected about it. You know, there's a whole range, but this is totally within bounds. And, you know, this is the safe side of those bounds where every time the chord changes, the note right on that chord change is a chord tone. And then the passing tones are in the cracks, right? There's a passing tone. And then we have additional non-chord tones, a little leap up, and then stepping down into our chord tone, neighbor tone back, chord tone, passing tone, chord tone, neighbor tone, right? So these are all like totally normal sorts of things that we might be doing, landing on chord tones, connecting with steps. But then for part B of the assignment, we wanted to see what would happen if we changed out the chords. Um, so the original melody that he had was, let's see if I can get that just, um, and so here we're gonna test our musical memory. <laughs> this is this is like one of those like sort of free benefits of working these exercises and thinking about these things is you get to experiment, you get to develop other skills. And one of them is our musical memory. So I want you all to think about that melody. So for my my memory here, I, I know it's starting on that D, the third of the chord, and then it's stepping down, and then it has a little leap back up to the start note. And then it's stepping and it's all steps from there, right? So that's how I'm gonna remember that melody. So can we all remember that? Sing it with me. Two, three, four. Let's do it one more time, make sure we all have it. Two, three, four. All right, keep that melody in our head. And now I'm gonna play it with the chords that I asked us to substitute. And I'm gonna play it with those chords. I'm not gonna play what he wrote here. I'm gonna play the original melody and see. So the question is, how did that melody work over those chords? This is starting off with that ninth, right? The note a whole step above the root. Well, Larry did that on purpose, right? Bum, boo, dum, bum, is the ninth of that chord. And then the ninth of this chord is where he landed. So Larry was fine with ninths. If we decide we're fine with ninths, we could have maybe left that note alone. Bum, da, 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 da. Right, we could have maybe kept that, that D. I'm playing a C minor seven. 
Adam. Here's where we have that place where, okay, I'm not so happy with that, right? Um, this is exactly the sound that I talked about earlier this week of that uh, dissonance that um, is maybe a little too much, that it's an avoid tone, right? So, um, so instead of I might have changed the melody to just and that might be the only note I changed. I changed was, you know, the fact instead of, instead of, I went, I just changed that and then kept the rest of it exactly the same and check it out. To my ears, that would have been just fine with no more change than that. No more change than that because that G going into the F could have been just fine. That's a non-chord tone on the beat that immediately resolves to a chord tone. And chord tone, major seventh, and then going up to our root, and then non-chord tone resolving to a chord tone. So that all could have been fine. And um, But, you know, uh, uh, I already forgot who this is, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Brian's, that's right. Um, so uh, Brian elected to make more changes. And I'm about to play Brian's version, but Dean, I, I want to uh, point out that this isn't actually in a different key. The whole point of this part of the exercise is we're going to take our original melody, but swap the chords. The original chords were these, B flat, E flat, D minor, G. So it was one, four, three, six, two, five, one. And what we've done here is try to take that same melody and flip the chords around. So we have two, five, one, and then one, four, three, six, with a little connecting five chord in between them. So the idea was to test to what extent does a melody we wrote over one chord progression work over another, and what sort of a minimal amount of change. So my minimal change was just to get rid of that avoid tone, and then considering the rest of it okay. Uh, Brian made a bigger change. he took the entire thing up a step, right? Because the original melody was and he took it up to and left back up to the original note and then our neighbor tone. So, right, he's taken the whole thing basically up a step. And now this works exactly as well as his original. It's all chord tones. Chord tone there, chord tone here, chord tone there, chord tones on the uh, chord changes. So, so Brian elected to take the whole thing up a step, and in doing that, managed to get all the chord tones to line up on the chords. So absolutely um, a valid uh, way of doing this. One of the things that I will challenge you in if you you know, work this yourself, is to not, not assume that you need that many chord tones. You know, to test to what extent are you okay with things like that ninth or that major seventh there or this ninth resolving here, right? You want to you wanna listen to this and say, wow, I wouldn't have thought to do that, but I kind of like it. That's part of the process here is to, to find some things you might have thought of, you might not have thought of, and then decide, hey, did I like this? And now you've learned something about ninths. And now you've learned something about when you do reharmonize things, that reharmonize, putting a chord underneath a note to make it a ninth gives it a particular sound. That sound of the ninth, um, in the melody, if you know a lot of like standards from the Great American Songbook, right? You know, the kinds of songs that, you know, Frank Sinatra sings and so forth sang. Um, lots of songs um, start off with a ninth. You know, and of course, right now I can't think of a single one. Someone help me. What is that? Because uh, I, I, I got Brian's melody in my head. Um, right, there's. Now you 
um, what is the name of that song? Crimea River. Autumn in New York. That's Autumn in New York. Um, so lots of songs from that world have really prominent uses of nights like that. First you say, first you say, you, you love me. Right, that's that's the line from, uh, um, from the Crimea River. I think I'm not quite getting that melody right, but I think you have the idea. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm. My brain has still got Brian's thing in in my in the head, so it's not working for me. Um, Okay, so uh, anyhow, that was something I wanted to focus on in uh, what Brian did there is that, yes, he has managed to make these all be chord tones, but when doing this, use it as an opportunity to explore not doing that, okay? So um, I want to now flip over to a video uh, that Tara, um, Tara, Tara, I'm going to go with Tara until you tell me otherwise, um, has done of harp because she had asked about like well to what extent are we going to be able to do this stuff on uh harp where um um what to what extent can we do this on harp given that chromaticism on harp is going to be difficult now this exercise is going to be the easiest one on harp because we don't really need any accidentals at all as we get through the course we're going to be doing more and more chromaticism um, so it's going to be progressively harder to apply the things that we learn to harp but this is what she's going to get to discover is how to make this work. And uh, Katarina is asking how to make it not sound random when using the non-chord tones. Well, it's very much about those resolutions. So I'm resolving it by step. So if you watch the lesson on non-chord tones, I give all sorts of examples of uses of non-chord tones and how they resolve by step. If your non-chord tone resolves by step, there's a good chance it's going to work. You just maybe want to avoid these situations where you have those avoid tones, which is basically that fourth on a major chord. There's some other notes. Basically, half steps above chord tones are a little more sour sounding, and you probably don't want to use them as prominently. But whole steps above chord tones, like that guy or this guy, is a whole step above the E flat, or this guy, a is a whole step above the G, those tend to sound pretty good. They sound rich, and yeah, you still want to do reasonable things with them in terms of resolving them, but uh, you have a lot of flexibility. All right, so I'm going to listen to Tara's example here. I'm going to pause that right there. This is lovely. This is beautiful. But I really have to call attention to a particular thing and see if you don't agree with me. I'm going to play this and pause it. At a, you, you heard me say yes, right? Check out what's happening. And I'm going to pause it before we get to the yes note. And you tell me if that yes note wasn't absolutely the only note she could have chosen. I would have had to like, I would have had to like, uh, get on her case, I guess, if if she didn't go there. Yes. That line there. This was going there, right? Can you hear how that just wanted to go there? Especially if I give you a little more context. Ah, 
those places like that where there's that just that note that just the line was going there and the chord supported it perfectly that's what we're going to want to create and then she does it again here you know, by continuing the line upwards, it really also had that sense of inevitability. This also addresses some of what Katarina is talking about here, um, where uh, there's, the, I mean, those were chord tones. There were no non-chord tones in there, but there's a sense of inevitability of where that line is going. And yes, you could try to draw out rules and say, well, that note moved by step and it moved, the leap moved, went this way and all these things. But it's it's about the sound. And that's why it's really important to work these things out, you know, on an instrument, do it on the piano, not just write it out or type it into MuseScore and hope for the best, but really think through these sounds in your head. So you think, where does that melody really want to go? Or when the melody, if we're reharmonizing a piece, which is what we're going to be doing for most of the rest of the chord, the melody will be given to us and then we're going to reharmonize it. Um, we're going to want to have that same sense of inevitability where that chord sounds like just the perfect chord that could have been chosen. So um, I'm now going to hear some of her uh, reharmonized, not reharmonized, but that melody Is over different original? chords. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Here's the altered chords. Oh, okay. So she's, she's got it like uh, one little Here's bit at a time. Original. Here's the original. <laughs> Right, so how's your memory? What did she do next? Is that right? I think so. I'm going to hear it again. And then she's going to give it to us with the different chords. Same melody. Ah, same melody. So. I'm, I'm grimacing not because she's doing a bad job. She's doing exactly what we asked for. Take that same melody, change the chords around, and some of the notes were surprisingly beautiful. Well, we got to hear that same D over the C minor chord, and this time it resolved up to E flat, a chord tone, and that was beautiful too. But then it became mm, a little more problematic. Some of the notes became a little more sour, and that's when I started grimacing. Yeah, so some yeah, some of those notes didn't sound as good. And then we're gonna see what she does to fix it. This is the same melody. That's that's an E flat over a D chord for if you're thinking about it at home there. An E flat over a D chord. That's that fourth, that's the avoid tone. That's that. And here's with the altered chords, but a different melody. Now she's going to change the melody to make it fit better. Ah, she kept the ninth. Yay! Yes! go. She got rid of all of the avoid tones. She kept the basic idea of her melody and changed things around to get rid of those avoid tones. And so again, 
it, and I think you just she just did a, a fabulous job of it. So really nice. And I love that she kept that ninth because I've fallen in love with that now that we've heard it a few times. I'm, I'm starting to really be into those nights. But um, yeah, again, the point of the rest of the course is going to be we're going to start with a melody and then change chords around as opposed to starting with chords and then changing melody around. But the aesthetic, the thing that causes us to say in our heads, um, yes, I like the sound of that combination is the same. Whether we start with a melody and put chords underneath it or start with chords and put a melody above it, either way, we have to make that decision. Did this work or did this not work? And in order to make that decision, we have to make, you know, we have to evaluate those sounds. How did the non-chord tones resolve? All those sorts of things that, you know, how are we using color tones? Do we have a void tones? These are all going to be the same sounds that we're going to have to decide in our head. Do we like that? Whether we start with chord and add melody or start with melody and add chords. So um, in the time that's left, I now want to flip to some of the abide with me, some of the people doing the uh, uh, project on, um, uh, and I've lost track. Yeah, so here's one. And Brian, ha I've, I've looked at one of others of Brian, so I'm going to uh, pick someone else's here. Um, this is Sue's, and you're saying your brain hurts. Well, let's see if we can help your brain out here. Um, I'm just going to let this play from the beginning. And this is Sue filling in um, Abide With Me, and we'll see how it goes. All right. So, Sue, I think you did a really nice job. There's a lot of cool, interesting things going on in here that I'll call attention to. Like, so you did this little, uh, right, that little thing. Now, in this case, you're leaping up to that C instead of stepping into it, right? This figure was a stepwise figure. And there's nothing wrong with that leap, nothing at all. However, I would observe that that F um, gives you parallel fifths between the previous chord and this chord. So that had that F been a B flat, we would have had three B flats and a D, no F, and that's fine. And then this would have been stepwise. So all, all things considered, just choosing to make that F be a B flat could have... Um, you know, been a way of making that little passage even better. Um, but I really like the fact that you did that little embellishment because that embellishment gives it so much interest. There's also parallel fifths, by the way, in the, um, the I'm calling it the left hand, but between the tenor and the bass from here to here. So realistically, that G probably needs to not be there. Um, and in point of fact, that chord is notated, the Roman numeral says triad, it doesn't have a seventh on it. So sharp four is A, so it should be A, just a diminished triad. So that note uh, G um, really shouldn't be a G at all, because that's basically the seventh that would turn it into a different chord. And you know, it's a fine chord. If if our job is to reharmonize, I'm, I'm totally down with that chord. I'm totally down with that chord. Um, Totally. But if we wanted to be true to what was written, the diminished chord, then we could have just made that G um, another A, for instance. And then we'd have had two A's, uh, but then we would have had to be careful not to resolve them both to B flat. So there yeah, are lots of things to have to think about as far as how we do this. Or maybe we could have made that G into a C. So I'll have two C's in the chord. That would have been possible also. Um, but I love that you've worked some more uh, like this little, right? You've got a non-chord tone here, F. This is supposedly an A-flat chord, and you've got a non-chord tone in the tenor resolving down. And it sounds beautiful. It sounds beautiful. It lets two, like right? the B-flat is also a non-chord tone. It's that length again, right? 
ninth coming down to the root. Such a beautiful sound. And she's complementing that ninth going down to root with a sixth going down to a fifth. And it's really a beautiful sound. And then she's giving a little passing tone in the bass. Beautiful job there, too. Um, now, this should be an E natural. When I put a capital six here, that means I want a major chord. That means, or a dominant seventh chord in this case. So in the key of E flat, one, two, three, four, five, six, it, it's a six dominant seventh chord. So this guy should be an E natural. So it should be, so. So this one should also be an E natural. Okay. So, um, yeah, good job. Uh, one thing about that uh, four chord, as you have it, I like the sound of these guys moving together. And these are both perfect fourths, and parallel fourths are not inherently a problem. But I will observe that um, there's something about, you know, this chord doesn't have a third, right? This chord basically has a root, a ninth, and I think of a ninth as being kind of a substitute for the root, because that's probably where it's resolving to. It's a whole step above the root, probably going down there. So in some sense, we have a root and another root, and then a fifth, and then that sixth is another fifth, the same way, right? It's kind of substituting for that fifth. So this chord doesn't get a third until beat two, and that's allowable. There's nothing you know illegal about holding off on the third but it is a very specific sound. So you want to pay attention to that. How much, like this sound is, is, is a pretty sound. It's a chord that has a sixth and a ninth and no third. It's a sound that we actually use in jazz fairly often, actually. Um, and so again, it gives it a jazzy sound and you get to decide, is that jazzy sound what you want or would you rather have some more third in there? Um, this line here, um, there was just one, uh, I'm hoping I didn't make the mistake here. 4-2 um, means third inversion. So this B flat chord, uh, root, third, fifth, seventh. Should have had the seventh on the bottom. And then the bass line would have been seventh. It would have been that. It would have been all stepwise. And that was kind of what the original did. And you'd have to ask yourself, is that E flat too low? Or maybe we want it here. is I think kind of how the original went. Da, 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 da. That is the line. And yeah, be expecting. When you see inversions in the Roman numerals, most likely it's going to be to be creating stepwise motion. That's the main reason we use inversions is to create stepwise motion in the bass. So again, getting back to uh, the question earlier, I think that was Katarina also asking, well, you know, should we be using inversions or should we mostly be using root position? In him, in chorale types of things like this with fast harmonic rhythm, the chord changing every beat, then yeah, we don't want the root in the bass all the time because it's going to be a whole lot of, it's going to be a whole lot of circle of fifths, right? a whole lot of jumping around in fifths because that's what chords do spoiler alert we'll learn more about that next week but um chords tend to follow the circle of fifths so without inversions the bass line is going to be really jumpy the main reason for inversions is to get rid of jumpiness so if you see inversions and you see jumps probably yeah, there's an op there's a missed opportunity in there. So this one should have been an A flat going to G to the F and then stepwise to the E flat. So those are some things to keep in mind there. But I really, really like the way you brought in those passing tones and the way you brought in that harmonic color there. It just really gives it nice sound. And this chord here, yeah, it's just a beautiful chord there and the chords are all given to us. So. Um, if you play the chords the way they were originally written and put the right notes in them, they sound nice, but those little extra touches like those passing tones and non-harmonic tones like that F, that non-chord tone resolving, those are what kind of elevate the piece to being that much more 
um, beautiful. So Joanna, if you go to the basic theory course and look at the uh, the last section of that course on chords, it goes through the whole business of Roman numerals and how to know inversions. But for triads, basically six is first inversion, six four is second inversion. For seventh chords, seventh is root position, uh, six five, do we have one of those in here? Six five is a seventh chord in uh, first inversion, four three is a seventh chord in second inversion like this one, four two or just two is a seventh chord in third inversion. But again, if you go to the chords section of the basic theory course, you'll get a whole, uh, a whole spiel on that. All right, I'm gonna keep flipping around some. And here is one from uh, Raj Elkowski here. And I'm just going to play through his and we're going to talk, you know, just get check the same thing. And since the first line is basically given to us, I'm just going to start the place where we actually, uh, you know, wh where the exercise starts in this measure here. All right, really nice there. And the reason I went, uh, here was uh, this. So what Rod has done is he has taken that diminished chord, that A diminished chord, and chosen to make it a fully diminished seventh chord. And again, if that had really been called for, there would have been numbers here to indicate that. A fully diminished seventh with a third in the bass, it would have said sharp four diminished six five to mean diminished chord uh, in first inversion. So, um, uh, if this had been calling for a fully diminished chord, that that is, it would have said six five there. But in point of fact, it sounds really good. I said I had no problem with the half diminished chord going to five. I would also have no problem with the fully diminished chord going to five. We're going to learn more about how diminished chords are treated later on in the course. So you know, for right now, when you see a triad write a triad until we learn more about it. But in point of fact, that is fine. And then the question also comes up about parallel fifths. This is a fifth. Let me zoom in a little more, sorry. Um, this is a fifth, but it's a diminished fifth going to a perfect fifth. Diminished fifth going to perfect fifth. Different theory textbooks will give you different answers as to how acceptable that is. Some theory books will tell you a diminished fifth resolving to a fifth is better than a, I mean, a diminished fifth resolving to a perfect fifth is better than the opposite. Um, some will say it depends on which notes in the bass and which ones in the soprano. And um, I'm not about giving you rules. I'm about telling you, well, be careful about that. Listen to it, check it out in the context and see if you're okay with the sound of it. Really focus on that and see if you are okay with it or if you have, you know, if something about it bothers you. The point of learning about that this is a potential problem spot is so you can listen to it and decide for yourself rather than just letting it blow by without paying attention. Uh, similarly, in the last line, I think there's something off in the inversions here uh, because he's got the baseline going by step from the A flat to the G, but this was supposed to be five, four, three, which should have been second inversion. It should have had an F in the bass on this chord. And so uh, um, he has the uh, um, he has the root in the bass as if it was just a plain seventh chord. But yeah, the, the whole point was to get that stepwise motion. And then it also would have stepwise moved by step into the one chord in root position. So if invert, if Roman numeral analysis is given to you with inversions, you know, try to try to honor those inversions so you get to um, hear the things. Oh yeah, Kevin, you had a question, and and thank you for asking that because I I had marked that as something I wanted to talk about. So in bar one, beat one of bar two, why was the E flat doubled instead of the root? That's a great question. Um, right here. Uh, So why double the E flat instead of doubling the root? So yes, it is generally better to double the root um, 
in general, in root position, in pretty much, well, second inversion we don't. But in this case here, um, I'm going to guess that there was some problem he was trying to solve. Because I'm, I'm at a loss, really. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I'm, I'm like trying to say, well, if the alto had a C there, would that have created some sort of objectionable parallel intervals of some kind? And no, not really. I actually have the answer, but I'm going I'm to keep this line of thought. Um, so first thing I'd be looking at is if I had let that D go down to a C, would that have created parallel fifths or parallel octaves somewhere? No. Would that have created parallel fifths or octaves going into the next chord. I would have looked at the same thing. Does that C create some sort of objectionable, par uh, objectionable parallel uh, going into the next chord? And no, not really. I guess I would say if we pay attention to the bass note there, and then the tenor note there, I kind of hear boom, and then the alto would be going boom. So I sort of have this, this illusion of parallel octaves there, two notes going from C to E flat, um, but it's not really because it's different in voices involved. That C to E flat is not one voice doing that, it's two different voices. So that would have been really fine. But here's the real reason. This tritone between the D and the A flat is supposed to resolve outwards. Tritones are supposed to resolve in contrary motion. Supposed to, again, that's the expected thing. That's what the ear wants. If it had been going to a flat major chord, a non-deceptive resolution, we totally would have expected that. So even when we get a deceptive resolution, it's typical to let that uh, tritone resolve the way it would have had the resolution not been deceptive. So that's... um. That's that is the reason. That is, I I I am ninety ninety percent sure that would be why he did it that way. But you're absolutely right. That that is a lovely sound, and so I think there would have been nothing wrong with having done that. But you know, this is a good textbook example of resolving tritones in contrary motion, and that principle that says, yeah, if you're gonna have a deceptive resolution, resolve it as if it was. Uh, the normal resolution. So deceptive resolutions, these are things we'll talk about more next week when we talk about function in harmony. So um, I'm out of time. And I've you know gotten to talk about a lot of things. And I know I can't possibly talk to everyone's everything. I can't I can't, you know, uh, give feedback to everyone's examples. I'm going to go through and post some stuff later about specific things that I find uh, noteworthy. But I'm hoping that everyone can see in the comments that I gave something that's relevant to you, right? Something that is like, oh, yeah, I ran into that, too. Or I almost ran into that and I solved it this way. And then maybe you can go post in the community and, and ask more about that. Um, so. Uh, that is what um, what I can be doing here is giving feedback that I think will help lots of people and um, and we can all be giving each other feedback learning from each other so I'm gonna keep posting more stuff over the rest of uh, over the rest of this week and the next week will be a new batch of lessons for the next section so hopefully you've gotten something out of the session pretty full a uh, lots of stuff that I'm talking about here <laughs> And again, Muscor wants to take a moment to wake up, but that's fine. So thanks, everyone, being here. And uh, yeah, we'll just keep doing this. So next week, there you will uh, you know, not have probably three different projects going at once for everyone to be working on. So I have a feeling we won't be quite as uh, overwhelmed with, uh, with uh, music to be listening to. Um, and uh, we'll just be talking about functional harmony one four and five we'll be doing more ear training involving that lots of things to be uh, digging into next week so by all means finish these projects up just get them posted the whether or not you get feedback from me on it just going through it is how you're going to be learning and interacting with everyone else looking at what everyone else has done and learning from each other so uh, have a great weekend and see you uh, see you next time